Hi, it's Chris Flanagan. Welcome to the Paediatric Emergencies Podcast. So today I want to talk about what I want from an impromptu RO assistant in a cardiac arrest. So who is this talk for? Um, it's not for trained RO assistants. So if you routinely help out with intubation in ICU or theatres, this isn't a talk for you. Um, if you've had formal training on how to be an RO assistant, again, this isn't a talk for you. This talk is designed at somebody who's called to help out with an intubation who wouldn't normally do this as part of their normal job. Um, it could be for a nurse, it could be for a junior doctor or even a senior doctor. Somebody who is that impromptu airway assistant helps out an airway expert with an intubation in a critically ill child. Okay, so that's who it's for. Um, but what situation am I specifically talking about? So this isn't talking about routine intubation and it isn't talking about emergency intubation, for example, with a child with status epilepticus or meningococcal septicemia. It's specifically dealing with the situation of the crash intubation where you're having to intubate the child without proper preparation. So you, you don't get all the preparation done that you would ideally like to do, and you're having to make do. You're having to balance preparation worth getting on with the intubation. Um, so that's who it's for, and that's the situation that I'm talking about. Um, just to mention here, I have done a podcast on intubation preparation and equipment. It's over on the website, paediatricemergencies.com, under the intubation course section. Um, so this deals with the routine intubation and the emergency intubation of an unwell child. But in this specific podcast, I'm going to deal with the crash intubation um, that happens and focusing primarily on somebody who's inexperienced with helping with uh, that intubation. Um, importantly, the title of the talk is What Do I Want from an Impromptu RA Assistant? So this is my own personal preferences, so this may be different from other people, so it's just to get that out at the start before somebody disagrees with what I'm saying. Um, but it's useful if this isn't something you're used to doing, there, there's probably no resource that you can turn to that's going to give you this short of formal training in this. Um, and if this is something that you are likely to be expected to do on a regular basis, then you probably should have some formal training. So before we get started with the actual podcast, um, I want to cover a little bit about why I think this is important and why I'm doing a podcast on this. Um, I think certainly the skill of intubating uh, a child in cardiac arrest um, with an airway expert there is really important to that child's outcome. Um, it's something that's been taught in APLS for years that um, if you have the expertise there, you should intubate these children. I know there has been studies done which show that intubation in a cardiac arrest um, doesn't improve outcomes. Um, but certainly my own personal experience is that quite often you get return of spontaneous circulation in the minutes following intubation. And the reason for that is that the majority of cardiac arrests in children are due to hypoxia. And securing the airway with an endotracheal tube is the best way to combat this and reverse the most likely problem that caused the cardiac arrest. And intubating a child is not a one-person job. Um, at the very least, you need two people. You need an airway assistant with you to help you do it effectively. So that child in cardiac arrest who needs intubated fairly promptly, um, providing you've got the expertise there to do it. Again, I'm not advocating that you intubate children if the expertise isn't there because that interruption in ventilation is probably going to be detrimental if you're not likely to get the tube in quickly. But in that situation where you have the expertise there, you need an airway assistant there to help the airway expert put the tube in in a timely and effective manner. So with that in mind, it's important that the team leader um, allocates somebody to help the intubator. Um, they can't do it by themselves, and so they need an airway assistant, and that needs to be allocated right from the start. Um, the other important thing with that airway assistant is they should stay with the intubator. Um, the intubator will often ask me, get me this, this, and this. Uh, and quite often when they look up 
again, the RO assistant is off doing another task. Because there's lots of tasks that need done in a cardiac arrest, but they need to stay with that intubator. There's going to be lots of other things they're going to need from that RO assistant. So important that somebody's allocated from the start and they stay with the intubator. Um, the next thing is they need to have a rough idea of what equipment is likely to be asked for. They need to be able to identify it and they need to be able to put it together. Um, so it's worth checking out that podcast I have on intubation, preparation and equipment. There's also um, a written guide over in the Paediatric Emergencies website that we've mentioned under the intubation course section. It covers all the equipment you're going to need. Um, in this situation, you're not going to have time to get every single item of that equipment that you would. You're, you're going to have to prioritise what you get. And this is really what this talk is going to be about. It's going to be about how you prioritise. But importantly, you're going to need to be able to identify the equipment quickly, put it together, and importantly, use your own initiative before the intubator asks for it. I think that's important as well. Um, so you should start setting up before the intubator arrives. Um, you know what's going to need to happen, and it doesn't make sense for you to wait until the intubator arrives and says, I want this, this, and this. You're going to know the age of the child. You're going to know roughly what they're going to want and the order that they're going to want it in. Okay, so the first thing you're going to need is a way to ventilate this patient while preparation for intubation is ongoing. So that's going to be a bag valve mask um, with an appropriately sized mask. So if you know what age a child is coming in, um, you need to have a rough idea of what size of mask is going to be appropriate for that child. So put that mask onto the bag valve mask and connect it up to the oxygen, 15 litres, and leave it running at the head of the bed. The other important thing um, that you're going to need is suction. Um, you need a large bore, yank your suction, um, turn it on, check it works, and then just leave it on, tucked under the mattress at the head of the bed. Because this is going to be needed quite often prior to intubation. Um, so there's no point having intubation equipment up, set up if you can't clear the airway and oxygenate your patient. So that, that, that comes first. So once you've got your um, method of bagging the patient and being able to suction the airway out in place, the next thing you want to do is start preparing your equipment for intubation. Um, and as I've mentioned, you're better to get on ahead and do this even before the intubator arrives if you've got time rather than waiting for them to come and tell you exactly what they want. So the important thing to remember with blade sizing is that you can normally intubate if the blade is too big for the child, but you'll really struggle to intubate if the blade is too small. And in fact, this is one of the common reasons I see um, people struggle to intubate children who don't normally intubate them, is that they've just picked a blade that's too small. We tend to use Miller blades in infants and then go on to Mac blades in older children. Um, and there's a whole range of different sizes in Miller and Mac blades. Um, so I need to give you a simplified approach to preparing for an intubation. And given that I've said you can always intubate if the blade is too big, um, but you'll struggle if it's too small. And in my opinion, the only Miller blade you need is a Miller 1. You can intubate a baby of any size with that Miller 1 blade. Um, you don't need to downsize it for a smaller baby. Um, so I, for anybody under a year, I would recommend that you set up for a Miller 1 blade. Um, it's somewhere between about six months and a year we'll start to tend to use a Mac blade. Um, but if you have a child under a year, we'll keep it simple, put a Miller 1 blade on. Um, from a year onwards, we can use a Mac 2, and you can use that right up until quite old children. But I would say maybe from eight years onwards, put a, put a Mac 3 blade on. Again, your Mac 2 will certainly go up to much older patients but you need a you need somewhere where you're going to cut off and like I say there's no problem I could certainly intubate a one year old with a Mac 3 blade and um, you can always intubate if it's too big so to simplify that under a year Miller 1 one year to eight years Mac 2 and above eight years Mac 3 so there's only three blades that you really need it's rare you'll need a Mac 4 um, in a child that they'll be big enough to need this. So importantly, you need to be able to identify these blades and identify them 
quickly. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is for that child round about the year, um, what blade is used will depend a lot on personal preference. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is just get we'll go with one blade, put it on the handle and have it ready to use. Because if I come down and I would much rather have a Mac 2, but you've got a Miller 1 ready to go in a 9 month old, I'm going to use the Miller 1. Um, I'm not going to worry about the extra 20 seconds it takes you to get the blade and change it over. Um, but in that situation you might want to put the Miller 1 on, but have the Mac 2 handy in case the, the person does want to change it easily. But if it's a 3 year old child, it's always going to be a Mac 2. There's, there's no need to change it. Or an Aeneas, it's always going to be a Miller 1. So three blades, Miller 1, Mac 2, Mac 3. Go with what you think is the right choice blade. And if the child's in those sort of intermediate ages, um, have the other blade available. But don't wait for the incubator to come and tell you which one they want. You're better to go with one and have it ready. Okay, so your blade doesn't work by itself. You're going to need a handle to put it on to. Um, and this is one of the things I've seen people who don't routinely um, put laryngoscope blades onto handles struggle with. And in fact, a number of times in a cardiac arrest, I've been handed a laryngoscope in two parts and had to put it together myself. So this is something that's easy fixed. Um, have a bit of a practice about how you put them on. And if you don't do it regularly, maybe practice it every every two or three months or so, so that you're getting familiar with putting the blades on the handles. Your resuscitation training uh, and simulation is so important for preparing for this emergency when it actually does happen. So you've sized your blade, you've put it on the handle, you want to check that the light works. Um, again, if it's an area that doesn't routinely get resuscitations, the batteries could be dead in your laryngoscope if it hasn't been checked. So check it's bright enough. And I would recommend that you just leave the blade open at this stage with the light on. Um, it's one less thing that you're going to have to do. You can see it works. And then you've got a working laryngoscope ready to go. Okay, so that's the approach for having a direct laryngoscope prepared. Um, obviously, if your department uses video laryngoscopy for most of your intubations, um, you would ideally want to have the video laryngoscope turned on and appropriate size blade ready to intubate. Okay, so you've got your laryngoscope of whatever type um, the, you're likely to use in your department. The next thing you're going to want is a tube that's appropriate for the child. Um, so when it comes to tubes, there's often a bit of debate between cuffed and uncuffed tubes. Um, but as somebody who intubates critically ill children, um, I would strongly recommend a cuffed tube, particularly for this situation of cardiac arrest. Um, you're likely to need high pressures to ventilate this child with chest compressions ongoing. Um, so you're going to be able to achieve those pressures with a with a cuff that's going to give you a seal around the lungs. And importantly you want to do the intubation once and once only. If you put an on cuff tube in and you're unable to ventilate the child effectively due to a leak, um, you're going to have to go ahead and do the intubation again to upsize that tube. So the big advantage of a cuff tube is it's generally one intubation and you're giving this child the best chance of inflating the lungs and oxygenating them effectively without having to go back and do a second intubation. So again, I would strongly recommend a cuff tube for this situation. Um, we generally, I would intubate all critically ill children with a cuff tube, providing it's not contraindicated. And the contraindications are generally less than three kilos or preterm. Um, Although in this situation I feel so strongly about the advantages of a cuff tube, um, I would intubate any sick child who comes through into the emergency department that I'm called down to see um, with a cuff tube in this situation. So you then need to be able to select the right tube um, for that individual patient. Um, and there's a whole range of formula um, that you can use to help you select the right size of tube. Um, but what I would recommend you do is use a micro cuff tube if you have them available. The big advantage of these tubes is they have the age of child on the back that they're appropriate for. Um, it's worth remembering a couple of a couple of ages. Um, 
generally it's the smaller children who will are more likely to present in cardiac arrest. And for a child up to seven months of age, it's a size three cuff tube. And from eight months to two years, a three and a half cuff tube. So a couple of numbers to remember um, for all the rest of them that are going to stay on the back. What age a child the cuff tube is for if you're using one of the micro cuff tubes. Um, for other tubes that are available to you, you need to either have a formula. Um, and again, a formula is probably not the best way of doing an emergency. What I would recommend is you have a little laminate that sits in your drawer um, that has the ages and sizes of tubes. So you can look at it straight away and pick out the right tube for that child. So um, traditional teaching for preparing for an intubation in a child is that you would pick out the right size of tube that you think is the right size and one size above and one size below. Um, with a cuff tube, because the diameter is generally slightly smaller than the same size of on cuff tube, um, it's rare that you will need a smaller tube um, for the child. And because the cuff is inflated and seals the airway, again, it's also rare that you're going to need um, a bigger size. So in the situation of cardiac arrest, you don't want to be, you have to prioritise what you're going to do based on the likelihood of you needing it. So in this situation, I would recommend just getting out the one size of cuff tube um, and knowing that the other ones are in the drawer available if you need them. Um, I wouldn't, I think you're, there's other things you're going to want to do in um, preparation. Obviously, if you have lots of time and the child still hasn't arrived, by all means, prepare one tube smaller and one tube bigger. But if you're trying to prioritise what you're going to do, um, I would just get one size of cuff tube out um, and have another one available in the drawer that you can quickly put your hand on if you need it. Um, you're also going to want a syringe because you're going to need to inflate the cuff um, once the tube goes in. So have a syringe available. Um, it would also be common practice to um, check the cuff of the tube before you put it in. Um, so you would put some air in the syringe, blow up the cuff, check there's no leak, and then fully deflate it again. And then as well, you'd want to provide some lubrication over the tube to help it pass easily into the airway. Um, and again, will you do that in the setting of a cardiac arrest, I think depends on the demand for that tube. So the intubator's there shouting, get me the tube now. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend checking the cuff before you put it in or lubricating the tube. Again, it's this is a balance of um, how much preparation you do compared to how quickly you can get the tube in. So if they're ready for the tube, I probably wouldn't check the cuff, but you need a syringe there to put it in because you, you might not ventilate the patient effectively until the cuff is inflated. So get the right size of tube, bring a syringe over with you with the working laryngoscope, and then if you have time, by all means, check the cuff before you put it in and lubricate it. But if you don't, you're going to probably have to rely on the manufacturer's quality control check that the cuff is going to inflate for you. So what I think your time is better spent doing is then putting a stylet into the tube. Um, I'm a strong believer of using a stylet for all intubations in a cardiac arrest. And the reason for that is the stylet gives you much more control in getting your tube into the airway in less than ideal situations. Um, quite often you have an airway full of vomit. Um, you have lots of movement with the chest compressions and you have the child inadequately positioned. So you don't always get a perfect view of the airway. But having a stylet in the tube helps you intubate in those imperfect situations. So I would recommend if you're an airway assistant, you then go ahead and put a stylet into the tube and have the tube shaped in the hockey stick or straight to cuff position. And you can have a look over on my website in that intubation preparation and equipment chapter on how to do that. Um, the straight to cuff approach is for um, direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy with a traditional shaped blade. Um, with video laryngoscopy with a hyperangulated blade, um, you need to match the shape of the tube to the shape of the blade. Um, but I wouldn't recommend um, a hyperangulated video laryngoscope for intubating in a cardiac arrest um, outside the setting of an anticipated difficult airway. Um, you're much better to use a direct laryngoscopy 
or a video ringoscope with a more traditional shaped blade because that's going to lead to easier tube delivery. So what I'm recommending is you get a cuff tube, put a stylet into it and shape it in that hockey stick or straight to cuff position. So once you have that, um, you've got everything you need to intubate it. You've got suction that's working. Um, you've got a laryngoscope with hopefully the right size of blade and you've got an appropriately sized tube ready um, with a stylet in it and you've got a syringe which is ready to inflate the cuff. Okay, so the next thing I think it depends on whether you're ready to intubate or not. Um, if the person's ready to intubate, I think you've probably got enough ready to go ahead and do the intubation. However, if you've got an extra 30 seconds, um, what I would recommend doing at this stage is getting the end tidal CO2 plugged into the monitor and put into the bag valve mask circuit. Um, this can either be done immediately before the intubation or afterwards. Um, I think if you're ready to intubate, it doesn't make sense to delay the intubation to plug this in. It can be done in the 10 seconds following the intubation. Um, because obviously you want to get the intubation done as soon as possible. But if you've got time, there's other things still happening, it makes sense to get this into the circuit before you intubate. So this needs to be easily accessible to you as an airway assistant. You need to know how to put it into the monitor and get the monitor working. Um, so again, this is going to be preparation in advance and how to do that. And it needs to be, I would recommend you store these sitting on top of the monitor so it's ready to plug in. Um, because you're, you're going to need to confirm the tube is in the right place with end tidal CO2. Um, it's quite difficult to confirm a tube in a cardiac arrest because you're, it's hard to look for equal air entry and chest movement because chest compressions are ongoing and obviously you don't want to interrupt those. So end tidal CO2 confirming the tube is essential. Um, it's something you're going to want to get into the circuit as soon as you can. But again, I can't recommend delaying an intubation to do that in advance when you've got all the other equipment ready. So I think whether you do this pre or post intubation depends on the specific situation. So you've now got a working laryngoscope and the right size tube ready to go. Um, so I would then recommend you go over to the right hand side of the patient. Um, the right hand side makes sense when it comes to passing things to the intubator, if you can go there. Um, so what you what you want to do is have the laryngoscope ready to pass to the intubator when they're ready to take it. Um, so you want to hold it the way it goes into the mouth. It's frustrating if you're past the laryngoscope upside down and then you have to turn it round and then put it into the mouth. So I would recommend you hold the laryngoscope in the way it goes into the mouth just over to the right hand side of the patient's mouth so the intubator can lift it and put it directly into the mouth without any delay. So once they've taken the laryngoscope off you, you're then going to want to hold the endotracheal tube in the same way. So you're going to want to have it just over the right hand side of the patient's mouth, pointing the way the intubator is going to put it in. So they're not going to have to look up from the airway to find where the endotracheal tube is. And they're not going to then have to then turn it round if you've passed it to them the wrong way. So you're going to want to pass it to them in a position that's right and the right way round so they can just put the tube in without any delay because having to look up even for a second they could lose the view that they have. Um, the reason I'm saying you hold this in your left hand is there may be a few things that the intubator is going to ask you to do. Um, one of them is to pass the suction. So it's probably worth before you start telling them the suction is on and it's just under the mattress there to your right. Do you want me to pass this to you during the intubation? And if they do, you can then hold this in your right hand so it's ready to be passed to them. I quite often like just to leave the, the suction there. I always leave it in the same place so I can lift it up myself and it's not having to be passed to me. So everybody's different. So I would leave it under the mattress, um, tell them at the start where it is and clarify do they want it passed or not. If they do, it makes sense to have this in your right hand. Um, the other thing that they, you may well be asked to do during the intubation is to apply external laryngeal manipulation. Um, this is quite often asked for as cricoid pressure. Um, 
I don't want to get into the name itself and whether it's appropriate or not, but really what the, the intubator is asking you to do is to apply pressure over the, the larynx to improve the view. And generally the pressure they're asking for you is posterior pressure. So you're just going to push backwards and that can often improve the view, particularly in small babies. So again, this is something that's worth practicing in simulation training um, so that you're able to do it for them. Um, as I've mentioned, you, you're intubating in less than ideal circumstances. The patient's not properly positioned, there's often vomit in the airway. So they will quite often ask for a little bit of help and that posterior pressure can improve the view and help them get the tube in. So they're the things you're likely to be asked for. Okay, so once the tube's in, the next thing you're going to want to do is take the face mask off the bag valve mask and connect the bag valve mask up to the endotracheal tube. Um, you should then pass this to the intubator to bag the patient while you get the syringe and inflate the cuff on the endotracheal tube. Um, the question that often comes up is how much air should I put into this cuff? And the answer is there's no magic number. Um, generally you want to put enough air in that the leak stops, but generally no more than that in that acute situation. So you're going to have your syringe full and you're going to inject air into the cuff just until the leak stops and that's the right amount of air. There's no number that I can give you in advance that's going to be the right amount of air. It varies depending on the size of tube and the individual patient. Okay, so the next job you're, you're going to want to confirm that the tube is in the right place. Um, if you've had time to put the end title into the circuit in advance, great. Um, you'll already be able to do this. Um, but if you haven't, this is probably the next thing that you want to do. Get it into the circuit as quickly as you can so that you can confirm that the tube is in the right place. This is assuming intubation goes straight forward. Um, this is going to be the general sequence and this would be my recommendations for the steps that you're going to want to take in the order that you're going to want to take them in. Um, if it doesn't go straight forward, there, there's going to be more equipment that people may ask for. Um, things like LMAs, Goodell Airways, Bougies. So it is important that you know your resuscitation trolley. You know where you can put your hands on all these things. Um, and again, if you have a look at that intubation and special circumstances lecture. Um, there's a checklist that I have um, over on that web page that covers all the equipment you're likely to need for intubating a critically unwell child. So you can familiarize yourself with this in advance. So when somebody asks for a certain thing, you're going to be able to put your hands on it quickly and get it for them. Okay, so we'll say the intubation did go straight forward, the tube's in and it's confirmed. Um, the next thing that's likely to be needed is it's going to need to be secured. Um, you may well be asked to hold the tube while the intubator goes and does something different. Um, so if that is the situation, what I would recommend you do is confirm where the tube is at the lips with the intubator. And it's really easy for that tube to move in or out um, with all the movement that's going on. Um, so if you do have to hold the tube, First of all, confirm the position and the best way of keeping that tube in that position is to hold it quite tight to the, the lips where it actually inserts in um, and watch the numbers. So I would keep an eye on the numbers so you're, you're making sure the tube doesn't move in and out um, as you're holding it. Um, it's also important not to pinch the tube too tight because if you pinch it too tight you can actually block the lumen. Um, and impair ventilation. Um, if you're going to secure the tube, um, it's important that you dry the face. Um, so get some gauze out, give the face a good dry before you try and stick any tapes to them. Otherwise, they're just going to peel off. Um, and securing the tube is a skill in itself. Um, again, we have videos over on the website, pediatricemergencies.com, um, where we show you a method for taping an endotracheal tube. Um, and this is obviously going to require some practice but again, something that can easily be done in advance. Probably the next thing I would recommend doing is getting a nasogastric tube out and then decompressing the stomach. This is going to make ventilation much easier. Um, during that period of face mask ventilation, obviously the intention is you're going to be putting air into the, the, the lungs. 
but quite often a lot of air gets into the stomach. And the full stomach can then splint the diaphragm and make and power ventilation. So this would be the next thing I would recommend doing once the tube is secure and you've been released from that. And quite often then you may well be asked to swap the bag valve mask over to one of the bagging circuits. Um, if you have an airway expert there, um, we quite often prefer using a, a bagging circuit. It gives us much better feedback um, and the ability to deliver PEEP as well. Um, so again, you just need to be familiar with the circuits that you may well be asked for and how to set them up. And again, there's advice on how to do that over on the intubation course section of the Pediatric Emergencies website. Okay, so that was really a quick run through of what I would want from an impromptu airway assistant um, during a cardiac arrest. So like with any emergency, I, I'm a strong believer in rehearsal in advance of the event. Um, it helps you perform better when the actual emergency occurs if you've anticipated potential problems and come up with solutions for how you're going to deal with them. So if you are somebody who at some stage could be expected to help out with an intubation, this is something that you should probably prepare for in advance. Get to know your equipment. Have a look at the section on intubation preparation equipment on the Pediatric Emergencies website and then do some simulation. This will be really key in identifying gaps in your own knowledge and identifying problems um, in your own department, whether it be it with equipment, with how the system works. So you're going to be able to rectify these in advance. Okay, so I hope you find this useful. Um, if you have any comments or queries, leave them over on the Pediatric Emergencies website and I'll get back to you. Thanks for listening.